We have an interesting and very timely program for you today. And I guess I should start by introducing myself. I'm Beverly Bean, president of the League. I could tell you a lot about Tom Moore without my speaker information, but he has such an incredible biography, I'm going to just give you a brief version of it. Dr. Tom Moore is our speaker today, and his topic is the future of the Fort Ord Reuse Authority and Base Reuse Plan. Tom Moore will summarize the history of the Base Reuse Plan over the past 20 years and evaluate its pro prospects for the future. Dr. Moore teaches military planning at the Naval Postgraduate School. He previously taught at the Monterey Institute of International Studies, and for nearly a decade, at, Na at the Naval Postgraduate School in the Graduate School of Business and Public Policy. He's also taught in various capacities at the University of San Francisco, Golden Gate University, Hartnell College, Virginia Tech, Stanford University, the California State University, Monterey Bay, and the Army Logistics Management College. So he is definitely a professor, as he has <laughs> stated to me before. Uh, he has degrees in industrial engineering, operations research, and mathematics, and is also a graduate of the Army Field Artillery School, the Army Engineer School, the Army Command and General Staff College, and the Naval War College. And he is a certified professional logistician. 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 He currently serves on the City of Marina Planning Commission and the Sierra Club Ventana Chapter Executive Committee. He previously served, for a very long time I believe, a real endurance, on the Marina Coast Water District, the Monterey Regional Water Pollution Control Agency, the Fort Ord Reuse Authority, ex officio, and on the Monterey Local Agency, Monterey County Local Agency Formation Commission. Well qualified to talk to us about this very important subject. Please welcome Tom Moore. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. So let's get right into this. This is going to be a two-part talk today. The first part, I'm going to talk about some work that I've been doing as a member of the executive committee of the Ventana chapter of the Shira Club. And I'd like to acknowledge the presence of uh, one of the subcommittee members, Jane Haynes, who actually has been doing all the work on the subcommittee. I just take the credit. She does the work. So I'm going to report to you on what we have been doing uh, and the direction we're going out of the Shira Club. When I'm finished with that, I'm going to take off my Sierra Club hat, literally, and we're going to talk about this, what I call, history of unintended consequences and uh, unreasonable expectations and a little bit about where I think they may lead. And so please note that part two of this talk are my own opinions, not the opinions of the Ventana chapter of the Sierra Club or Sierra Club California. They're just my personal opinions. Back about 1997-ish, the Fort Ord Reuse Authority was developing the base reuse plan. And the Ventana chapter of the Sierra Club, I wasn't a member of the executive committee at the time, was a bit dissatisfied with that plan. And a lawsuit was filed. That lawsuit was settled in 1998 uh, out of court with a settlement agreement between the Ventana chapter of the Sierra Club and the Fort Ord Reuse Authority. Fast forward a few years, and last September, as we were approaching the sunset, the scheduled sunset date of June 30th, 2014, of the Fort Ord Reuse Authority, the Ventana chapter said, you know, we ought to get together with those folks in FOR and see how we're doing with respect to this settlement agreement. Uh, and in addition, there was a deadline in the settlement agreement requiring FORA to reassess amongst other things, the existing base reuse plan and to do so by 2013. So we wanted to take a look at that. So since September, we've had seven two-hour meetings with FORA. We have basically internally assessed FORA's compliance with the settlement agreement. We, that's an ongoing process. We have held considerable discussions with them concerning the possible extension of FORA beyond its existing 2014 settlement date. And we are beginning to participate with them in the, uh, this reassessment of the base reuse plan. Uh, here's just a quick list of typical meeting attendees so that you know who's been 
participating in this process. And it's not exclusively Sierra Club. League of Women Voters has been represented by Janet Brennan, who's here in the room, uh, Land Watch by Amy White, and either the politicians themselves or some of their staffers. So here are some of the uh, results here from the Sierra Club's perspective, and that is we produced in January a letter to Bill Monning, and I have to admit this was a long debated call whether we were going to support or not the extension of FORA, and we came down in our committee ultimately supporting a six-year extension, which is exactly what we put in the letter to uh, Assemblyman Monning. And in addition, in the letter, we put in a series of six recommendations to him with respect to what we thought we'd like to see in the extension legislation. He does have some choices. The extension legislation could simply take the existing legislation and change the sunset date, and that might be all that happens. Or there could be other clauses placed in that legislation, at least theoretically. So let's take a look at what we recommended. First of all, and this one is quite strongly supported by a variety of recreational and environmental organizations in the community, and that is that the previously developed urban core that has buildings and hard stand parking lots, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, on the former Fort Ord should have priority for development over existing wildlands, coast, live oak, forest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, that being said, this is a recommendation. This particular kind of recommendation we acknowledge might be a little difficult to write into state law. State legislators tend to not want to get down into that level of detail in local areas for fear that you establish that as a precedent and the next thing you know the legislators from LA are telling you you know how many bathrooms you can have in your house in Monterey County. Secondly, we want to see in this reassessment changes that address what has gone on over the past close to 18, 19 years in the local economy, in the local environment, and with the redevelopment of the former Fort Ord. In addition, when the settlement agreement was put together, and maybe this was unwise on our part, we said that any appeal fee that FORA would have to appeal a decision of the Fort Ord Reuse Authority would be set at the same level that the county's appeal fee was set. Well, at the time, back in 1998, the county's appeal fee was under $300. In the intervening years, the county's appeal fee has increased to over $5,000. There's very, very few people in Monterey County who can afford to pay a $5,000 appeal fee. So we believe that something needs to be done about that. And indeed, uh, Ms. Haynes has been working quite hard to try and get that fixed outside whatever Bill Monning does with respect to this legislation. We'd like to see an annual performance report, and our letter included a variety of things, not just environmental and recreational issues, but issues having to do with development development plans. We'd like to see an annual performance report out of FORA made public. One of the interesting pieces in the enabling legislation that created FORA in the first place was a little clause that said, when you reach the sunset date, Whatever your obligations are, whatever you own, just take it and throw it over the fence to the Local Area Formation Commission of Monterey County, and they'll figure out what to do with all of that. We thought that that was a little bit of a weak termination and transition plan. <laughs> and indeed, uh, Bill Monning uh, just recently announced that he agrees with us on that. There is an amendment that he has submitted to the legislation which went in as a placeholder and only extended the date. There is now an amendment to that requiring FORA itself, staff and the board, to develop and approve a termination and transition plan at least 18 months in advance of their new termination date, whatever that turns out to be when it comes out of this sausage making process that we call the state legislature. Lastly, we'd like to see FORA televise all of their meetings, board meetings, committee meetings, and so forth. And uh, FORA has indeed told us that they've made a commitment to start broadcasting and placing on AMP their board meetings starting this April. I see Steve Ensley's in the audience. Any change to that uh, plan at the moment? Okay, thank you. 
In addition to this process, another thing we did, we, we felt we wanted to get input from some of the other environmental and recreational groups in the county. So we've convened uh, since uh, a little before Christmas what we're just calling the environmental summit meetings. We've invited these sorts of organizations. We've helped them understand the settlement agreement, which obviously now is old, back to 1998, and you can't expect sustainable Monterey County, for example, to know all about that settlement agreement, because I don't believe you existed in 1998. So these folks have met with us, we've taken feedback, we've had some very, I think, fruitful and interesting discussions, and one activity that we are engaging in is to internally, eventually we'll let everybody see it, but to try and come up with a consensus vision for the base reuse plan because we do, I think, all believe that it needs some revisions of various sorts. We want to participate in that process and we think having a vision out of the environmental recreational organizations in the county uh, that have interests on the former Fort Ord would be beneficial. Okay, so off comes the hat. That's <laughs> what I've been doing officially for Sierra Club and now come personal opinions. I apologize for anyone who may find certain parts of this talk it may be a little bit uncomfortable. It may be a bit like, say, going to the dentist. <laughs> but you know, professors, we like to prod. We sometimes play devil's advocate. We sometimes say outrageous things just to catalyze thinking on the part of our students. So um, if it's at all painful, just remember what my wife tells me every time. I go to the dentist, she says, Tom, just remember, tell the dentist, no Novocaine. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna start with a little Monterey Peninsula history because it bears on the behavior of certain land use jurisdictions that have uh, authority over parts of the former Fort Ord. You may recall President Truman back in 1948 ordered the desegregation of the US military, which included, of course, the former Fort Ord. But July 27th, 1948, just by practices, not necessarily by law, we still had effectively segregated communities here on the Monterey Peninsula. Civil Rights Act 1964 made nationwide segregation illegal, okay? And yet, when I took a job in 1986 at the Naval Postgraduate School, I was in Virginia at the time, finishing my PhD, and the secretary of the department, a very professional lady, sent me a nice welcome packet. It had all sorts of information about the Monterey Peninsula, and information about realtors, and she'd even taken that, some of you may recall, an old map that the Naval Postgraduate School used to publish for the Monterey Peninsula. It's a very nice map, I wish they still put it out. She'd sent me one of those, and interestingly enough, she'd put some markings on it. In fact, she'd even used a red felt pen and put a big red mark, and you can probably guess what part of Central Seaside she marked, and noted, probably don't want to look for housing here. I didn't know anything about the peninsula. Okay, fine, it's maybe a bad neighborhood or something, I don't know. So I ended up in New Monterey. So 1948 to 1990, if you look at Seaside, you go back and look at the results from the U.S. Census, uh, the census we do every 10 years, you'll find that Seaside is a community back then that had a large percentage of blacks, many of them with connections to the U.S. military. If you take a look at Marina, kind of an interesting place, it has, even today, the largest fraction of what you would call biracial families on the Monterey Peninsula. So, is this a racial issue? Is this an economic issue? I don't know. You know, make your own judgments about that. But it affects how folks in those cities, in those areas, might think about the larger peninsula. And when I went on planning commission in Marina in about 1989, I would hear these things from local citizens about how, well, those folks over in Monterey, Carmel, PG, Carmel Valley, you know, pick your non-marina or non-seaside location here in town. And those, those folks, you know, they're always looking down their noses at us. They, they think we're not very good or they, they don't think highly of us. 
Thank well, rumors in 1990 began circulating that we're going to close the former Fort Ord. And you see the dates here by July 11, 1991. This was confirmed. Fort Ord is going to be closed. Of course, it turned out to be not so much closed as to substantially reduced in size because we still have the Ord military community out there. So perhaps here's unreasonable expectation number one as a consequence of this process. There was testimony by a Bush administration official before Congress. I don't have the exact quote from the testimony, but in effect, he said, with price of real estate here in the Monterey Peninsula, we can sell off Fort Ord and pay off the national debt. I think that's an unreasonable expectation if one knows anything much about basic economics. And if one knows anything about the groundwater contamination then existent at the former Fort Ord, the 7,000 acres of unexploded ordnance, the tons of lead, and by the way, bullets aren't all made strictly of lead. There's other metals and chemicals in there. Tons and tons of that out on the dunes, lead paint and asbestos, particularly in these old World War II barracks. If you think about it, lead paint, one reason we used it, it's great against saltwater mist coming off of the ocean. Okay, unreasonable expectation number two, clean up a Fort Ord could take 20 years. <laughs> Bless his heart, that was Walter Wong's prediction back there in 1991. Of course, we know today that that cleanup is far from over. 13.9 million has been spent by the Army to date. We need another 60 million. This was information from the Fort Ord facilities chief, same time. Just the ESCA area, which is a portion of the cleanup area that Fora has taken over responsibility, which has made it into the news, I'm afraid, recently, was a $97 million grant amount. So we far exceeded the cost to clean this place up. So back to the demographic makeup of folks in Marina, folks in Seaside. And they get the news that the former Fort Ord is going to close. They already have their boundaries extended onto the former Fort Ord. They think that you folks who don't live in Marina and Seaside look down upon them. You got all the good tourist goodies and all the big hotels and all the high-end houses and all the money for the city. Well, by darn, we're going to catch up. We're going to show you guys. And I could hear that from citizens going to these planning commission sessions. And you could argue maybe this was an understandable reaction, but we'll get to the unintended consequence here in just a moment. Here's some of the quotations from the paper at the time. Both Seaside and Marina convened through their planning commissions or their city councils processes to bring citizens together. What are we going to do with all this acreage that we're going to get on the former Fort Ord? I know a submarine base. Let's build a couple of wharfs out into the bay. Okay, it's all sand and it's eroding, but you know, we can, we can keep up technology, will fix anything. A theme park, let's get Disneyland to build us a theme park. we put it right there where the unexploded ordnance are. Ooh, wait a minute, okay. A festival plaza, let's compete with, uh, what's the name of that plaza right down by the main wharf in Monterey? Yeah, where all the Customs House Plaza, where all the festivals are held. Let's compete directly with that. Let's close the Monterey County Fairgrounds and move it out to the former Fort Ord. Those folks in Monterey don't need that anymore. But what do you think some of the reaction was to some of these ideas making it into the press on the other side, so to speak? Well, here's then Seaside City Manager talking about this process. And note the underlined, all right? We've got land use jurisdiction, we meaning Seaside, Marina, and the county predominantly, and nobody can take that away. We've got it, we're gonna decide what to do with this, all right? Interesting, this was an interesting, lengthy editorial, or uh, interview published in the Coast Weekly with both Mr. McNeely and the then mayor, Lance McClare. Here's Coast Weekly kind of asking this question, and McNeely responding saying, yeah, there's fear. It has to do with the fact that seaside is seaside, whatever the heck that means. And there may be some fear about the economics 
Are we going to begin competing so heavily with the tourist industry on the rest of the Monterey Peninsula that will harm that tourist industry, I think, is what he's suggesting here. Some more reactions. It's fear, traditional mistrust. Interesting. Now, I remember at the time not particularly being a fan of Lance McClair, but then he wasn't my mayor. Kind of interesting perspective, though, he has. And he doesn't chalk it up to racism. He chalks it up to class warfare. Okay. Interestingly enough, here's the Herald's perspective. And if you look at this editorial statement, from Seaside's perspective, Seaside's going to say, excuse me, you're accusing Seaside of being parochial? When was the last time the city of Monterey tossed some money over the border to Seaside? When was the last time any other peninsula city did anything like that? You know, every city here on the Monterey Peninsula is, in fact, by definition, parochial. You want to be on city council? I don't think you'll last very long if you're tossing money across the border to another city. You have to serve your own citizens. Um, by the way, I would suggest League of Women Voters maybe convene at some point some interesting talks about the fact that we have 100 thousand plus or so people amongst seven cities here on the Monterey Peninsula, whereas a roughly equivalent number of folks over in Salinas, they elect one city council. Folks, city councils here are in, on the peninsula, are competing with one another. They're competing with one another for the next transient occupancy tax dollar. They're competing with one another for the next sales tax dollar. So. One of, one of the issues I see, Marina and Seaside predominantly, and the county secondarily, have put together plans in accordance, or at least the Fort Ord Reuse Authority has determined them to be consistent with the base reuse plan that was developed back in 1997. By the way, in FORA's defense, the only real land use power they have is to determine whether or not a plan of the city or any of these underlying land use jurisdictions is actually consistent with that 1997 base reuse plan. All right? They don't make the plans per se themselves. The underlying cities do that. So effectively what we have today is a consequence of approved plans that have been determined to be consistent with the base reuse plan and one major development called Marina Station that the city of Marina on the north side of the city off of the former Fort Ord has approved. We now have about, and I'm trying to remember the numbers from my slides, 5,800 unbuilt but entitled housing units. All right, think about that number. Let me give you another number. When Seaside Highlands was built, they built 379 homes. And they sold those homes, not counting the marketing time, whatever length that was, prior to the first sale of a home. But if you go from the date of the first sale of a home to the date of the last sale of a Seaside Highlands home, they sold at an average rate of 190 homes per year. That would appear to be, at the time, the market absorption rate for brand new, in this case, rather high-end homes on the former Fort Ord. Now, that was when the market was also pretty good, right? Those homes also didn't have to pay capacity charges to Marina Coast Water District like future homes amongst those 5,800 unbuilt entitled homes. Well, let's do the math. 5,800 divided by 190 is something like 31.3 years. By the way, that 5,800 does not include Monterey Downs, does not include the Delray Oaks Project, there's a third project proposed that doesn't include. Those would add probably another 10 years to that process, assuming that everything sells at 190 homes per year. Now, what could change that? Well, the original reuse plan also called for 45,000 jobs to replace the 37,000 existing jobs that were there at the time Fort Ord closed. So far, it would appear we've maybe gotten three or 4,000 of those 
45,000 planned jobs. So I've asked this question a number of times. If someone would please explain to me where we can find 5,800 homeowners who can buy a $300,000, $400,000, $500,000 home and nobody living in the home needs a job. But wait a minute, the plan called for 45,000 new jobs and in fact some of those came from CSUMB, a good thing. 500 acres was set aside for a research industrial park right on Reservation Road. So if jobs are important, to make the houses go forward, then one would think that bringing in the jobs there would be very important, which would make you think that you'd want to select a developer for those 500 acres who had experience nationally, was capable of building a research industrial park, had a track record doing that, doing it well. I know, let's pick UC Santa Cruz. Well, okay, we'll give UC Santa Cruz a chance. And that was 18 years ago. They produced maybe 100 or so jobs in 18 years, right? And before a board, my own city council just seems to be okay with that. So my point is, and my overall prediction, is unless there's a fairly significant change in direction, fairly significant change in this base reuse plan, fairly significant ratcheting back of the pipe dreams that a lot of folks had. If we stay the course, the existing course, we're going to see at least 31 years, and my guess is it'll be more like 50 additional years, so that at the end of this will be 70 years after the closure of the former Fort Ord. And what we're going to see over that period of time is a trickle of houses built, a trickle of jobs brought in. We will continue to see World War II era barracks along Highway 1 rotting into the ground, dropping their lead paint and asbestos along the way. If that's the future you want, great. That's not my particular vision. And I don't want to leave you with a really uh, sort of down, pessimistic, dour. I think there are changes that could be made to the base reuse plan that could mitigate some of this problem. Number one, you've got to put a lot more emphasis on bringing jobs. And I don't mean jobs with titles like stock clerk or cashier, because those poor folks aren't going to afford any of these new homes on the former Fort Ord that being real middle-class jobs. And the place to do that is that 500 acres off a of reservation road. And I don't know what that means with respect to the relationship with UC Ambest and University of California at Santa Cruz, but you've got to do something about that. I certainly applaud the ratcheting back of the Cypress Knowles project that the City Council for the City Marina is engaged in. I think you'll have a lot better chance building a small retirement and continuum of care facility there and building on it over time. I would advocate that the city for that, also for that parcel, see if you could convince the state of California to build another veterans retirement home. The nearest one is a couple hundred miles away here in California. Do we have any veterans who end up as widowers having difficulty in retirement in this community? Yeah, I'd say so. I'd say so. I think we need to strongly emphasize the outdoor recreation, tourism, ecotourism, whatever you care to call it, for the former Fort Ord. And we need to begin marketing that collectively uh, and protecting that asset. The national monument status for the BLM lands would go a long way towards that. But there needs to be action on the part of the, the hospitality industry and the cities to promote that in a variety of ways. So uh, I think it's possible to change course. I think it'll take a lot of folks working at it. You know, the Mayor Delgado has suggested we need governance changes in fora. 
I'm not uh, opposed to those sorts of things. Uh, some of the cities who are on fora, who send representatives and have a vote, have no land whatsoever on the former Fort Ord. And they pay approximately fourteen or fifteen thousand dollars a year for that vote and seat on the board. Well, that's not very much that they're paying for that. So, you know, if it's really worth something, maybe they ought to be paying some more. So, uh, Beverly, do we have time for yes? Would you like questions? To take questions, or would you just carry on? I, I'll be happy to take questions. Yes, ma'am. The removal of, of many of the old buildings along that you can see from uh, Highway 1 is dependent on the developer removing them. Uh, <clears throat> would you care to give us a prognosis of whether or not that's going to occur? I mean, I hate to put you on the spot, but... And, and in response to that question, you might explain, if you can, how this removal of old buildings works, because it's really complicated. I'll, I'll do my best, and I suspect Steve Ensley will be able to correct any mistakes that uh, I make in that regard. It is complicated. There's a variety of deals. Fora has itself some obligations that it's taken on to remove some of these buildings. In some cases, what they have done is effectively through deals transferred that obligation to developer. For example, the Dunes developer uh, was supposed to pay, uh, what was it, 42, 48 million, 40, 46 million for the property. Uh, they haven't bought it all yet, they bought their first phase. And they're getting a discount of 42 million or so, something on that order, in order to do building removal in the future. Uh, what's the prognosis? Well, um, you know, I gotta, I gotta ask how many, who knows how many new uh, homes for private sale have been constructed and sold on the former Fort Ord since the last Seaside Highlands home sold about six years ago. Anybody know? Zero. Zero, that's correct. There's been one built, it's the model over by Banna and Black Horse. I, I don't know whether you want to blame that on the housing economy. I'm not sure it was bad for all six of those years. In their defense, some of those entitlements came in after the start of that six year period. Personally, I think having 5,800 entitled unbuilt homes does something in basic economics. I mean, what happens when you have a large supply of something in a local market? What is that increasing the supply? What's that do to the unit price? <clears throat> unit price goes down, right? So what if having 5,800 entitled unbid homes in this market, this is within four miles of downtown Marina, what if that in the minds of these five or six limited liability corporations has decreased the price they think they can sell those home for, homes for to below what they believe it will cost them to build those homes? What action do you think they're going to take? None. None. And until that situation is somehow turned around, you know, in hindsight, we can say, well, you should have phased it. You shouldn't have given out all those entitlements over about a two or three year period. Well, cat's out of the bag on that for the most part. Um, so uh, back to housing removal or building removal. Seaside has some obligations in one of their parcels. Uh, Marina Heights has an obligation to complete. It has not completed all the building removal with the economy with the nature of the development agreements with these developers, there's very little leverage the cities have to force them to remove these things immediately until they start making profit. I have two questions. One is that instead of removing those buildings, why not make them reusable temporarily because the build out place so long instead of putting it down, knowing the community there are homeless and veterans needing housing. So that is a poss possible route to go. And another question is that why the six years extension 
if the horizon is 31 years, 70 years, at the end of six years, we need another extension. Why not just go for 20 or something? All right, so let me take the first question, which was, why not reuse some of these existing buildings? Well, a number of buildings, in fact, were reused. Uh, CSUMB has done so and done a good job. A couple of housing areas have been reused in the partnership between the City of Marina and the Fort Hood Reuse Authority. The problem with many of the remaining buildings, the, these are now the buildings that early on, 15, 18, 17 years ago, people didn't choose, maybe because they weren't in such good shape then. They've been unmaintained for all of this time. And it's a sad fact also that I can almost guarantee that every one of those buildings has been looted. Somebody went in and stripped out all the copper, all the high dollar value circuit breakers, etc., etc. So it's unfortunate, but many of those buildings are not today in a condition to be reused. Uh, the best you could hope for is tear them down and maybe reuse some of the lumber, although Ford did an experiment with that and said it was too expensive, too problematic. So. And your second question was? Six versus 20. Um, why six versus 20? Well, uh, our letter to, to uh, Assemblyman Monning was based on the discussions we had in the fall with that group that I talked about earlier. And at that time, all of those discussions were for a six-year extension. I'm told that when Assemblyman Monning actually submitted the legislation in the state legislature, the Office of Legal Counsel came to him and said, look, you know, you better ask for 10 years because you never know, you can always negotiate downward, but you can never negotiate upward. So his legislation went forward for 10 years. As for 31, I, there are a lot of folks who have been thinking heavily about the reuse of the former Fort Ord who are really, really invested emotionally, mentally, in these various deals that have been crafted. And we all know it's difficult. You get really emotionally or financially invested in some of these things. It's hard to change course, and it's hard to listen to anybody say, hey, it's not going to work. So I can't say that I've gotten a lot of traction with what you have just heard today in certain arenas. Beverly. I'm concerned about transparency. It seems to be, to me, that there's been a <laughs> lack of transparency in some of the planning that's gone on, such as with the Monterey Downs project. And more importantly, there's been a lawsuit just filed about the uh, lack of transparency over how the almost $100 million mm -hmm. for cleanup has been spent. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I believe that the executive director tells us that it is not public right to know how that money has been spent. Would you care to comment? I don't really know what sort of backroom politics might be involved with Monterey Downs, haven't been privy to those things. I will tell you that when we had the discussions with Fora that touched on Monterey Downs, what they said was, Fora's had nothing to do with Monterey Downs. That's a county project which the county is bringing forward. And it hasn't come to the Fora board yet for a consistency determination. The implication being maybe the Fora board would find it inconsistent with the base reuse plan. I don't know that that's a fact, but I guess it's a possibility. This may, to a certain extent, be a little bit, I suppose, of a, a flaw in the whole process, not, not necessarily having to do with Fora per se, but the fact that there's no there's nothing in the legislation that created FORA. There's no process that has been, to my knowledge, put together by FORA that says early on you've got to come and get a preliminary consistency determination from us so that you don't go ahead and spend $50 million doing an EIR and doing all this planning and doing all these drawings only to come to FORA and have FORA turn it down. But that doesn't exist. Right to know how the cleanup money is being spent. That's very interesting. I, I've read the, I read Michael Stamp's filing with the court. I was 
when I read that, that was when I learned that for a, alleges that they can't even see the insurance policy. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's clearly a strong argument to be made that there's some problem somewhere with transparency there. I don't want to point fingers. Maybe it's for a, maybe it's the insurance company. I, I don't know. And I will be very, very interested to find out what the courts say about that as public record. I guess my concern is that we have this authorization proceeding before this court determination. It made me very much doubt any kind of reauthorization was indicated in the, in the face of such a overwhelming lawsuit. The structure of the Fora Board is such that they have quite a few members who, if you will, in some ways don't have a dog in the fight. But more importantly, what happens if you are the mayor of Carmel, just for instance, and you go and support some really, really awful decision by Fora that just turns out terribly badly? How's that going to reflect or affect your reelection possibilities? Well, basically, not very much, folks. So that may create to a certain extent, insufficient motivation to really pay attention to transparency and these other issues. I've been very heartened by the result of the Whispering Oaks outcome. And some folks have said to me that this is a little bit like the uh, Arab Spring. <laughs> well, it's, it's certainly potentially like the Arab Spring. If you've gone to the Keep Fort Ord Wild website or some of these other websites, they're using all the latest social media stuff. And they're getting to a young voting part of the electorate here. If I were a politician at the county level or on one of these city council meetings, I'd want to be paying attention to that. And I'd want to be paying attention to the 18,000 signatures that came in with respect to Whispering Oaks. And if I are in Fora, I would want to be paying attention to that, right? Because there is a message there. I mean, I do know there are some folks on that side who have some serious money that they care to put into processes. So in the past, maybe you're the mayor of Carmel and you don't really have that much connection. Although I, in her defense, <laughs> the mayor of Carmel seems to have been one of the more engaged non land use owning folks on Fora over time. Okay? Uh, but you might want to be paying attention to that because maybe it will affect you. What you do on Fora today may affect you more than it has in the past. Tom, would you feel comfortable kind of uh, describing or overviewing the dispute between the city of Marina and Fora? on the old base housing area and the mortgage that was taken out against that? I'm happy to do so. This is the Preston Park housing area that was called Preston Park when Fort Ord was open. It's been turned into rental housing. It's rental housing that brings in about $3 million a year net rental receipts over the cost of maintaining the property. It was supposed to, according to legislation, go from the Army to Fora, to City of Marina, no charge. Except that there's another term in the enabling legislation that says that Fora can, for some period of time, and I'm sure when the legislat legislators wrote the legislation, they understood Fora had a 20-year life, and that Fora would need some money to do things on the base. So basically, Fora crafted an agreement in accordance with their enabling legislation where they and the city of Marina share the revenue from that particular property. So the city of Marina has been getting $1.5 million a year into its general fund, I believe, and four has been getting $1.5 million. Now, the controversy is that uh, a few years ago, Fora, which had obtained fee title to the entire Preston Park subdivision from the Army, went out and borrowed $19 million from Rabobank and pledged the property as security for that loan. Um, you know, I, I don't 
quite know what the title folks at Rabobank were thinking. Maybe they didn't read the enabling legislation and understand that this was a property that was supposed to come to Marina eventually free. So it's now encumbered with a $19 million loan. The city of Marina says, whoa, whoa, we didn't agree to an encumbrance of $19 million. Uh, this is your problem, Fora, and we want the subdivision. Fora says we need money, especially if we get extended for another 10 years. We have a number of obligations we haven't completed. So we're going to sell the subdivision to, a private, to the private sector and we think we're going to get $58 million and we'll split the net. We'll pay off the $19 million loan and split the rest with you, Marina. Of course, there are folks in Marina on both sides of this issue. There's, there's a candidate for mayor who says, sell it, take the money and run. Uh, there's other folks, other candidates saying, wait a minute, $3 million a year in perpetuity indexed with inflation, that's a pretty significant Thing, and that's got to value a heck of a lot greater over time than just this one-time injection of capital. So does that rather... Okay. Yes, sir. Hi. My name is John Hutcherson, and for those who haven't read today's Herald, you ought to read the editorial about this. Uh, for an agency, that being our topic of conversation, for somebody who cannot find a receipt for $83 million spent, how could we possibly be worse off with LAPCO than with them? <laughs> First of all, maybe I should. <laughs> okay, first of all, the Sierra Club subcommittee was completely unaware of that lawsuit and the issue at the time it sent its letter to uh, Mr. Monning. No way for me to tell, in hindsight, what impact that would have had on the executive committee's decision making or the subcommittee's decision making from Sierra Club. You know, in, in our judgment, there were uncertainties connected with LAFCO and the LAFCO process and the lack of that termination and transition plan that well, I characterized it. <laughs> I characterized it as picking the lesser of two evils. And not that either agency is evil. It's just the uncertainties involved. For example, what happens to the Sierra Club settlement agreement, which, which has a few chops in it, has some benefits for the base reuse process. What happens to it when Fora sunsets? It's a settlement agreement between Fora and the Sierra Club. I, I don't know. And that's, a, I'm not an attorney. I've heard two different opinions from two different attorneys. One saying, oh, LAFCO will figure that out, no problem, and the agreement won't go away. Another attorney saying, well, there's no certainty that that agreement will still be in place once Fora sunsets. For it has a number of obligations, and this, you know, I suppose this goes back to uh, things that past four boards have done, but uh, one has to presume that the four board understood what its sunset date was, that that was June 30th, 2014, and yet they made decisions that obligated themselves to projects and financing issues that a reasonable person might have said, wait a minute, this can't be completed by 2014. Well, now we're stuck with those obligations, and that's part of the reason for this potential extension of FORA. Personally, I, I don't, there's uncertainty in both alternatives. Right, keeping FORA, how will that turn out? Getting rid of FORA, how will that turn out? I can't say myself for sure one's going to be worse than the other now. There are other folks who have different opinions. Uh, in that regard, so. Yes, ma'am. How was Sephora funded? Well, it has been funded from a number of sources. First of all, each of the voting members contributes a tiny little bit, you know, 10, 15,000. What's, what's the, the fee? Yes, as you said. All right, so 14,000 per vote, 
200,000 or so a year as a consequence. That's a tiny amount. Land sales that have occurred, they get, I believe, half of the land sale amount. And then as homes are built or commercial properties are developed, they have a series of fees. Current fee per single family home, it, isn't it up around 50,000? 34,000. 34, okay, that's why I'm thinking close to 50,000. Uh, and in addition, there are now some fees that have to be paid called capacity charges to Marine Coast Water District for any home that's built. And those have to be paid at the time they pull the building permits. Well, how many building permits have been pulled in the last six years? <laughs> One. What's your current budget? Well, it fluctuates. It's roughly a million or two million a year in operating expenses, which is pretty clean and mean for an organization. Okay, so one to, one to two million a year in operating expenses. But that's not the bigger piece of the budget. One of the things that I have criticized, and you saw me if you went to the Oldemeyer Center make this point, criticized 404 is they've used land sales money and some of these other revenues in big chunks to build infrastructure. Now, there's nothing wrong with building infrastructure per se to support the reuse of the former Fort Ord. The criticism I had was that they chose certain aspects of the infrastructure to build far too soon when it wasn't needed. The example, of course, is the extension of General Jim Moore Boulevard, which is you know now a nice four-lane highway that we don't currently need to serve current traffic changes caused by the reuse. I can also tell you that Marina Coast Water District was induced to put an awful lot of pipe in the ground long before it was needed. UCM Best, maybe 10 years ago, came to us and said, ah, we're going to bring all these jobs in. It's really important. We're building these roads there north of uh, Reservation Road, and we're putting in the water and sewer infrastructure, and we don't have enough fire flows, so you got to dig a hole underneath Reservation Road and connect us up with your water supplies, which happen to be on the south side of Reservation Road. Well, Marina Coast Water District put a million dollars into increasing the fire flows just to serve UCM best. And how many buildings and jobs have they brought in there since 10 years ago? Pretty much nothing. And so there's no ratepayers to pay back that million dollar investment. So there have been a variety of things put in the ground, put on the ground, that aren't particularly useful, are depreciating as we speak. By the time they become useful, we're probably going to have to repave them or change out the rotted old pipes, etc. Is for a, or the Fort Ord reuse, is it unique or are there um, lessons learned from other bases that have been closed that could be applied? I'm not that familiar with some of the other closures. That's a great question. I do believe that for a and its enabling legislation is unique in California. And it's unique in a way that kind of goes back to some of these issues we talked about earlier, and why you might understand that Seaside and Marina in particular are not that happy, I don't want to say with FORA, but with the FORA enabling legislation. Because effectively what the FORA enabling legislation did was take land use powers away from a California city. Now imagine the precedent that potentially sets. Imagine Bakersfield and San Francisco and Sacramento and Fresno getting together and saying, you know, we are just absolutely tired of LA taking water from Northern California. So we're going to go to the state legislature and we're going to get legislation that lets us create a committee that will be able to determine whether anything the city of Los Angeles does with respect to land use has to have our approval. All right? Well, that's effectively what has been done over the last 20 years to Seaside and Marina. Um, you can understand from the perspective of their staffs and city councils that they're not all that happy about that. What's your best guess at this point as to whether FORA will be extended or not? 
My, my guess is it probably will be extended, but Bill, you're from Keep Fort Ord Wild, and that may have something to do with what Keep Fort Ord Wild does or doesn't do in the future, and some of the other organizations. So I, I don't know. Thank you. I have one comment and one question. My comment is in response to the issue of what would happen if Fora went away? What would happen if the Sierra <coughs> Settlement Agreement or other contracts? And just for the benefit of everybody who hasn't had a chance to actually read what the clause says, if you don't mind, I'll just read the one sentence. Please. It's the very last sentence in the Fora enabling legislation. And it says this. The Monterey County Local Agency Formation Commission shall provide for the orderly dissolution of the authority, including ensuring that all contracts, agreements, and pledges to pay money or repay money entered into by the authority are honored and properly administered. It continues, but that's the key phrase. I think that language is pretty clear in itself, and the question is whether it's the devil you know or the devil you don't know, and in some cases the devil you know is worse than the devil you don't know. <laughs> and LATCO is a very good organization for what we've seen. One question for you. We've addressed a lot of other things here today, and you've mentioned water, but I'd like to ask you about it. Marina Coast Water District, as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, and the Fort Ord community get, the, get its water not from the 180 aquifer, or the 400 aquifer, because those are heavily seawater intruded in that area. But from the, what's called the deep aquifer, it's an 800 foot aquifer that is ancient, ancient water that was percolated down tens of thousands of years ago and simply is not being recharged. Why? Because we're overdrafting the two upper aquifers. I understand that Marine Coast Water District and Fora have no idea how much water is there and how sustainable it is. In fact, it's unsustainable because anything that's not being recharged is unsustainable. So my question is, is what, are, what are your opinions about that? Maybe not the Sierra Code or Marina Coast Water District, but what are your thoughts about development in an area? 5,800 entitlements and all sorts of hotels and racetracks and all sorts of other things are planned, but even the existing development does not have a sustainable water supply. I have said that I thought the dreams for the former Fort Ord were too big and need to be scaled back. That being said, the Fort Ord wells do take some of their water from the 400 foot aquifer. Seawater intrusion has caused us to take, has caused the Coast Water District to take one of those wells out of service and re-drill it and I believe not screen it in the 400. A lot of the water, you're correct, comes from the so-called 900 foot aquifer and that is very ancient water. We had the, the geological survey came out and put a monitoring well in at the site of Marine Coast Water District's current headquarters on the beach uh, eight or ten years ago. Uh, that well is a special testing well. It's perforated in about four different elevations as it goes down all the way to close to 2,000 feet. The water down at 2,000 feet was carbon dated at about 23 or 24,000 years old. There are relatively few wells in the 900 foot aquifer. A consequence of that is we have less knowledge about how extensive that aquifer is. When I first went on the board of directors of Marine Coast Water District back in the early 90s, I asked the question of our then consulting engineer, Dave Foote, I've been hearing about seawater intrusion. How long is the deep aquifer going to last us? So the answer he gave me in about 1993 was, well, we think maybe four or five more years. Now, it has lasted a lot longer than that, okay? Surprise, surprise. And we have not seen significant indications of seawater intrusion into it. <clears throat> we do have that monitoring well, and one of the reasons it was built there was to get some indication whether seawater would intrude into the 900-foot aquifer or not. Technically, legally at least, the Ord community has rights to 6,600 acre feet. And it's the obligation of the County Water Resources Agency to fix any problems that arise with seawater intrusion, to fix the seawater intrusion problem. They estimate, 
whether you believe their estimates or not, and the hydrology is complicated, and they don't have they don't have wells in every single place to be able to have 100% knowledge of that uh, that hydrology. But with the use of reclaimed water in the Castroville area, they've roughly cut back about 10 to 14,000 acre feet per year in the estimated 25 to 30,000 acre foot per year deficit into the Salinas Valley groundwater basin. The rubber ducky dam was supposed to take care of the rest. Now it's had its problems. It's only been in existence for about uh, two years now. So uh, I think news at 11. If I were, if I were God, I would say we ought to be very careful, but then I'm just personally disposed to harboring resources and saving a lot. I remember coming out of the barracks where I was a platoon leader back in the 1970s, wheeling my bike down the sidewalk and my company commander and his wife walking next to me saying, Lieutenant Moore, you're so cheap, you squeak when you walk. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I would say, Let's be very careful, but I, I'm not too worried because of what I said earlier. We proceed with this pro-growth plan that was put together primarily by pro-growth forces, and we're going to see mostly no growth for years to come. That's almost the biggest irony of all of this, that the plans are so big that they've created this backlog of entitled unbuilt houses, and nobody's building, and any choices about who builds the next house and where it's built is completely out of the control of any local governments. It's completely in the hands of the market and the individual LLCs that hold those entitlements. And I don't know what they're going to do. There's certainly no transparency there. <laughs> Other questions? Kenny. Um, Tom, I appreciate the dialogue that's going on um, several things she said, I have a question about, or I might just make a quick comment on, then I'd like to ask you a question. Um, you had mentioned that on the ESCA, on the cleanup, that um, this whole question of we hate Fora right now, because <laughs> it's an agency we love to hate. Um, my understanding is that the Army is actually the one that determined the conditions for the cleanup, including what would occur in terms of how the transaction, the financial transactions took place. So even though it may be kind of fun and interesting right now to beat up for it because supposedly they're not transparent, they may in fact not have the ability to do that. Do you have a different understanding than that? I, I'm not sure I have any understanding of those, those details. Yes, the Army did play a role, but I wasn't privy to those discussions, so I don't know. I, the, the one, I suppose, good thing, even though it's, it's painful for you as a PR person for, for Fora and Steve and Darren as staffers, to hear all this negativity about the agency you work for, I think one good thing that's likely to come out of this whole process is explanations and, if you will, more transparency that folks understand, ultimately, I hope, what exactly transpired with the ESCO. Um. So, and, I'm, and I don't want to belabor any particular item. My understanding, though, um, on another item that was brought up having to do with the infrastructure, is that the requirements for a lot of the infrastructure out there were not for our requirements. They were, for example, the, the roads were required by TAMSI and by AMBAC. Those roads were in the base reuse plan. But required originally from Tamsi and AMBAC. Okay. And just another thing, because I think it's important for people to have full perspective on this, and I'm not trying to, you know. Absolutely. No, I, I, I agree. Um, on, the, on the Crescent Park issue, for example, everybody has their position on that, and it has gone through some legal dialogue. Um, and I think that's what it was. I think it was a difference of opinion and a difference of positions on that. And 
the one thing I wanted to ask, or uh, the last thing I want to comment on, is my understanding is that um, the dissolution of FORA, while it may be able to be taken over by LAFCO, and certainly that's, the, that's one of the options, LAFCO has options to then say, we'll let jurisdictions take it, particular jurisdictions, which could be the individual land use entities, or it could be the county as a whole, or it could be some other option. But that there are other aspects of the extension that people may want to consider, one being the Habitat Conservation Plan, which actually is the fundamental basis for us having preserved, I mean, us, the community, um, having over 18,000 acres preserved at this point. So I guess my final question to you is, I didn't hear you saying don't extend for it. I just heard you providing some information. And, and people can make their own decisions. But I, I appreciate that these dialogues are going on because I think it is critical for the community to have full information. Excuse me, Candace, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, I believe you are a paid representative. Absolutely, yes. Could if you re identify yourself? Yeah, Thank absolutely. You. If anybody doesn't know, I am a, a, an independent contractor, and I do have a contract to provide public information on behalf of FORA. And I think many of you know that because I've talked before or you know who I am or whatever. I also have contracts with a, a lot of different other things, and I, I'm not here officially for FORA today. I'm here as a lead member. Um, you, you're quite right that some of the requirements that ended up in the base reuse plan that FORA approved originated with other, with other agencies, and that's quite, that's quite clear. That being said, I think it's not too late to reassess the plan to make changes to the plan that accommodate change conditions that we, we see today. And I think there's a tremendous amount of momentum within a lot of parts of the community to do exactly that. Does anybody's guess what the decisions of the four board will be? I think it's anybody's guess what the decision of the state legislature will be with respect to uh, continuation. And no. We sent a letter of support for the extension of FORA <laughs> with recommendations. Bill. Well, yeah, you say it's not too late to reassess, but there's a big debate between what reassess involves and what update involves. And my understanding is assessment is sort of what we do in education. We assess someone, are they passing or so Updating would mean changing something. And so if we say it's not too late, why aren't we saying, wait, we're not going to approve that plan until it's been updated and reassessed? That, that's, I don't think that's a terribly unreasonable position, although accomplishing reassessments with compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act, you know, consumes money, consumes time, uh, those are some of the practical issues with with doing that. The, the reason I use the word reassess is because that's what's in our settlement agreement. And do I wish our settlement agreement said update? Uh, yeah, you bet I do, but uh, it didn't say that, so. We've run out of time. <laughs> I want to thank Tom Wolf. Thank you for handling some very difficult and to-the-point questions, and I urge you all to inform yourselves, to make your voices heard, and we'll see you next month where we'll be talking more about water. Thanks for coming. <laughs>